the Word of God to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. I've selected one verse, but actually uh, we will be looking at the context a little bit. So we will read from 6, verse 6 to verse 9 of chapter 1. And I believe we do have the PowerPoint, Brother Faisal, right, of the verses? Just one verse? Oh, just one. Oh, can we read those actually then? Yeah, 6 to 9. Thank you for being ready. Uh, let's just read these verses <coughs> responsively. <coughs> Take turns. And I'll start us with uh, verse 6 of chapter 1 of the book of Acts. And so it reads, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Amen. This is the word of God. Uh, what comes to your mind when you wake up each morning? Are you excited for the day, or are you just surviving each day. Maybe a bit of both. Every, it depends on the day you're in. Maybe towards the weekend, you know, you're excited. Maybe on Monday morning, you're just surviving, just getting through. But for us Christians who uh, have the Spirit of God inside, every day can be exciting. Every day is, in fact, a journey. It's not going in circles, just making, you know, doing the routine things over and over and over again. There is a progression, there is a direction, there is a purpose. Because we are not uh, ruled by our circumstances, but we are led by the Spirit of God. That is the secret to Christian living. And we call that, you know, just, we just say that that's journey of faith. Every day is a journey, just like we were on a mission trip this past week, and you guys prayed for our trip. Every day is a journey with God. And when we are led by Him, we are excited. God, what will you show me today? Who will I meet? How should I respond in these difficulty situations? God, what is your plan for my life? And there's the joy and sometimes sorrow of discovering God's will and discovering my weaknesses. But at the end of the day, we are thankful for a life that has been so exciting, a day that has been so exciting, and we look forward to greater things yet to come. It was uh, C.S. Lewis, I believe, who said, we are too easily amused. He likens our lives to a little boy who's playing in the mud, having fun under the sun, playing in the mud, make, making a mud pie. Because he doesn't understand, he, doesn't, he hasn't experienced the ocean, Pacific Ocean, Pacifica over there, Half Moon Bay, the Grand Ocean, spending a day in the vast ocean of God's grace. And C.S. Lewis says, we are too easily pleased or amused. We need to understand what the Holy Spirit can do in our lives. If we truly have the Spirit of God, God the Creator, if we have His leading in our lives, our lives will be never boring. It can never be boring at all. But have we dwindled our expectation of God to our size, to our daily routine size? What can God do in our lives? This morning, we'd like to remember, remind ourselves what happens when the Spirit of God starts to work. And uh, I'd like to use this opportunity to share with you, with the, all of our church, uh, what God has done uh, for us, to us, during the mission trip. And uh, as we go through this together, we have two points, two uh, lessons that God shows us in His scripture that we've selected this morning. Two things, what happens when the whole Spirit of God works and to, the first one is this. He gives us the power to restore the kingdom of God. Can you humbly say it with me? He gives us the power. He gives us the power to restore the kingdom of God. You see, in this context, Jesus was spending his last 40 days with his disciples. After his resurrection, he was spending, spending his last days on earth. 
And the disciples knew this. They knew that their time with Jesus is very limited. And he was teaching them about future stuff. He was taught, teaching them about the kingdom of God and an exciting era, exciting time of their life, what is yet to come. Yet they were afraid. They were scary. There was a lot of uncertainty, yet Jesus was giving them direction. And at this time, they were wondering about one thing. Jesus, you're saying a new era, a new epoch is about to start with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? What does it look like for us? And there was this burning question inside their heart. Jesus, when is the kingdom of Israel going to be restored? Because they were fed up with the current government. They hated paying taxes to the Roman government. Do you hate paying taxes to government? (laughs) <laughs> we won't answer that question right just to yourself but they didn't like it because they were oppressed they were the oppressor and they were the oppressed they didn't like the Roman officials and people on the streets making fun of their culture and religion and their worship to God it made them very uncomfortable that they were the rulers and they were a little bit better than slaves they wanted the freedom they wanted true independence. They didn't want a governor, Roman pagan governor, reigning over them. They wanted a priest. They wanted a a man of God ruling over them like before, like David, King David. They wanted their national leader. And so they had this burning question inside their heart. Jesus, you say the Holy Spirit is coming. A new era is starting. When? What's going to happen now? You know, even today, uh, in our Christian circles, we always have this uh, desire. You know, the gospel should change society. The gospel can change our government and our social order and our system. And the wrong should be made right. And, uh, you know, there's a need for social gospel. There is a place for that. But we must remember that social gospel was never the forefront Never the true, real agenda of Jesus Christ because we find the answer, how Jesus responds to this, the, the, uh, the question of Jesus in verse 7. Verse 7 says, He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by His own authority. So one hint we can get, gain is that Jesus doesn't deny their question. Their question is valid. Jesus is saying someday, Someday, in God's good time, when there is a new heaven and new earth. In fact, when Jesus comes back, a new era, a new generation, a holy people will be raised, a new heaven and earth will be established, and all the injustices, all the inequality, and, and true love and true peace will reign, uh, and the kingdom of Jerusalem, of Israel, will be truly restored. So Jesus is acknowledging that, that it will happen, but that should not be our focus right now. That's what Jesus is saying. Instead, he goes to verse 8. He says, um, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. There is something missing between verses 7 and 8. Jesus is saying, don't focus on the kingdom of this earth. But he's saying, focus on the kingdom of God. In fact, seek the kingdom of God first. And, and God will, uh, the Spirit of God will empower you to, in fact, do this. That's what Jesus is trying to teach them at this very last time. And they were to do this. Seek God's kingdom first until Jesus comes back. And that's why verse 9 is included in our, in our Bible. It's, uh, he's asking them to continue on this. Just like he went up into the clouds, until we see him come back in the clouds, we are to continue to focus on the restoration of the kingdom of God. Jesus wants restoration uh, in his kingdom. Jesus wants our lives, all the people's lives, to be restored to God's will. We must, again, I want to emphasize that Jesus was talking, not talking about a physical kingdom, our government, democracy, communism, or our dictatorship. He wasn't talking about those systems. He wasn't talking about capitalism. He wasn't talking about communis- com- com- communism. He wasn't talking about these systems in the world. That was not his interest. 
But he was truly interested in the true oppression, the true injustice that was in the world. That, that is the injustice of sin, of the oppression of Satan and death. Death which has reigned over all humanity without any exception. Everybody is under the reign of death. And Jesus is envisioning a kingdom of God, restored kingdom of God, that frees his children from the pangs of death and sin, or from the enemy. He wants to see his children once again live, dry bones live. They want to, he wants to see his children become children of God, not children of the world, still children of Satan. So if that was Jesus' focus at the end, as he promised the Holy Spirit, it should be our focus as well. We must focus on the expansion, the restoration of the kingdom of God. And uh, throughout the mission trip, we saw just that. You know, you hear about stories from Guatemala, the caravan coming up, these poor people coming from Guatemala, starting from Guatemala, making, making their way up to Honduras and, and then to Mexico and the southern border and their, you know, um, border patrol right now and all the, the camps are filled up and filthy environment. We hear all these things, but it's true. Guatemala is a poor country. You know, so they, uh, young people want to go into the U.S. to m earn money to send back to their homes, to mom and dad, to their, to their uh, wives and, and their kids. We did not go to Guatemala to improve their lives, right? We didn't go there to give them gifts or to, um, to um, make their, uh, give, give them medical benefits. We cannot restore the kingdom of Israel for them. But our true motivation was like what Jesus says. It was to restore the kingdom of God. Restore what God intended uh, for them. And I'd like to just show you a story of one of our sisters, what she experienced as she was on this mission trip. And I hope it comes out the first time. Hello, everyone. I am Minnie. I went on a mission trip to Guatemala last week for children's VBS, English classes, and local family visitations. I would like to share a story of a family I met and ask for your prayers. It's a family of two. The husband is Hector, 82 years old, and the wife is Dolores, 85 years old. Hector was crying before, right before our visit due to severe pain. Dolores had a stroke and the left side of her body was paralyzed, so she couldn't move or speak. They have belief in Jesus and one of their kids is a pastor, but since they live far, Kids visit only once in a while, and most of the time, it is just Hector and Dolores. Hector said he is praying that God just takes his and Dolores' lives as soon as possible. As I heard that, I didn't know how to pray and was honestly scared. However, Pastor Choi asked me to pray for them and said if I didn't know what to pray, it was okay to just pray, Lord, please help them. So I prayed that Hector will have no more pain and when they cry and pray, please give, give them peace. Also, many people visit them and pray for them so that they won't feel loneliness, but instead feel Jesus' love. After my prayer, Pastor Choi shared a short message and prayed once more for Hector. When we introduced ourselves and told them we're from California, America, to share Jesus' love and pray for them, Hector told me that he appreciates that very much and that it's very nice of us to come to Guatemala and visit them. Hector was just waiting for God to take his life soon but he praised me and appreciated me, and this made me very surprised.
the next morning God gave us the scripture first Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 7 for this reason brothers in all our distress and affliction we have been comforted about you through your faith I thought how Hector and Dolores are in distress, distress and affliction and tried to help them and comfort them, but I was comforted by them. This is God's way and Jesus' love. I praise the Lord that Jesus sent us to the family and comforted both our team and Hector's family. Thank you. Thank you. We didn't clap before, but she's here, so we clapped. Thank you for the beautiful story and testimony. How, what would you, how would you pray if you met a couple like 80-something years old and say, I'm so aching all over my body. I'm just tired. Would you pray that uh, I could go? Would you, how would you pray? Would you say, God, would you just take this person and meet me with you and kill this person? How would you pray? You know, there was nothing that medicine can do. There is no restoration, in fact, for their physical state. But... Pastor Choi and uh, Minnie and was there somebody else too? Oh, Hijin, Brother Hijin. They prayed and may maybe just the soft prayer saying, Lord, Lord, nothing fancy. Asking them God's presence would be with them right now. God would comfort them and, and they would know that God is here and God loves them. Reminding them once again how Jesus has died for them on the, on, for them on the cross and there is an eternal life in the future. Just that reminder has transformed their, this couple's heart from sorrow and pain to heavenly joy, even to the extent of saying thank you for sharing your love with us. And that joy is transferred to us, in fact, even to Cornerstone Church. I see that as nothing other than the power of God. Who can give a dying couple, you know, no hope, that kind of joy and confidence and, and that love? Only the Spirit of God can give. Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit will empower us so that we can continue on to expand the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus, in, even from the first sermon that he ever preached, he said, you must seek the kingdom first and his righteousness first. And all these things will kind of fall into place. All these things will be added to you. When we indeed seek God's kingdom first, seek the presence of God in that person's life, the love of God that has been promised to that person, if we truly pray for that in that person's lives, they will receive the satisfaction. They will truly, their needs will truly be met, not only for this earth, but beyond. The only person that brings, up, brings this kind of, this change this satisfaction that filling the need in their lives is not our cornerstone team. It is the Holy Spirit, which God has promised us. Even though this couple was at the doorstep of, of death, and even though it was a simple prayer of Lord just asking for his, his help, it, it was a tremendous power for this holy couple. And God gives his people the power of restoration, of, of the heart, change of heart, to be thankful, to be at peace, to be in comfort with God. Uh, at the end of one of those days on the mission trip, uh, we, you know, we always have a time of sharing of what we experience and we thank God for the things that he has done that day. And uh, one evening, uh, you know, uh, Samonim, who is the missionary's wife, she told us about, a, uh, you know, the, um, she was amazed at the wonders of medicine. So because she was a receptionist for the medical ministry, she received all these people. And she mentioned one person. Uh, it was another elderly lady. And her name was Concepcion. Concepcion was her name. And she was 88. And when uh, she came with her daughter, her daughter actually brought her to the clinic the, uh, to, for acupuncture. 
And uh, when she first saw this elderly lady, she was so stiff, you know, she, her, her hand, her arms was so stiff, it, could, it wouldn't go down, like she was like, like dried up, almost seems like. She was so thin, uh, like, like a corpse, and she had no expression on her faith. And um, she, uh, someone witnessed uh, after, you know, she went into the, you know, went to get the acupuncture, and after she came out, she was a totally different person, you know. She, could, she was more relaxed, and she could see that her face was a lot more happier, and it was, she was smiling, it's full of grace. And she said, so you doctors, you know, your, your oriental medicine, acupuncture really works. What wonders you have done. But we were all surprised when Dr. Min, who was the medical team leader, he said, actually, the story is a bit different, what happened inside. I want you to listen to his story on your own, by yourself. Can you play that for us? Hello. 세 명의 한 의사가 3일간 120여 명의 환자를 이곳 그 미국에 있는 한의원 수준의 그 설비와 또 정성으로 치료를 하였습니다. 감히 생각하건데 치료 효과도 상당했음을 확신합니다. 또한 전체적인 운영을 담당해 주신 노의진 노의식 팀장님 그리고 한번한번 한 환자에게 열정적으로 기도를 해주신 어, 이미진 형제님께 특별히 감사를 드립니다. 어, 이번 선교 중 가장 제 마음 속에 와닿은 사례를 간증드리려고 합니다. 어, 사역 둘째 날한 어, 따님이 어머님을 모시고 오셨습니다. 어, 어두운 표정에 안색도 안 좋고 또 매우 긴장하는 그런 모습이었습니다. 어, 몸 전체가 아프고 귀도 잘안 들리는 그런 환자분이었습니다. 따님의 치료를 한참 보고 계시더니 어머님이 두려운 표정으로 이제 침을 못, 맺, 못 맞겠다고 하시면서 따님과 거의 그 싸움을 하다시피 해서 그런 집으로 돌아가셨습니다. 어, 저희도 바쁘고 해서 어, 그럴 수도 있겠다는 그런 그 생각을 했을 뿐 별다른 그 의미를 어, 둘그 마음의 여유가 없었습니다. 어, 그런데 그 다음날 어, 클리닉에 혼자 오셨습니다. 오늘은 그 딸이 어, 일을 하러 가게 돼가지고 용기를 내어서 어, 오신 것이었습니다. 하지만 여전히 얼굴에는 두려움이 가득한 그런 갈등하는, 갈등하는 그런 모습이었습니다. 어, 그녀의 갈급함을 느낀 우리 팀은 다른 치료를 일시에 중단하고 그 어머니를 위하여 기도하기 시작했습니다. 스페인시로 한국말로 어느덧 10분이라는 어, 그런 시간이 어, 지나가고 있었고 그 어머니의 표정은 밝아지기 시작했습니다. 어, 또 몸도 많이 릴렉스 됨을 느낄 수 있었습니다. 그 순간 어, 그녀의 눈에서 눈물이 어, 쏟아지기 시작하더니 기도에 감사드는 말을 계속하면서 우리의 기도를 통하여 자신을 사랑하고 있는 당신들로 인해 용기와 기쁨을 느낀다고 하시면서 자리를 뜨셨습니다. 침술을 통해서라기보다는 중보 기도를 통한 영적 치유를 경험하게 되는 순간이었고 하나님의 응답을 우리를 통해서 이루시는 현장을 체험하는 순간이었습니다. 어, 이래서 내년에 있을 단기 선교가 더욱 기대가 됩니다. 감사합니다. Did he just promise next year's mission trip he's going to go <laughs> publicly to all of us? Anyway, you know, it's amazing. It wasn't the needles that cured this elderly person. The doctors admit, all three of the doctors, they prayed for her for 10 minutes. She was so afraid. And uh, someone thought that it was acupuncture. But when, when she, her spirit was restored, when the, spirit, the, the kingdom of God was expanded in our hearts, you know, it was added on to her. We saw truly a miracle happen. 
uh, in the mission field. When the Spirit of God starts to work, we receive the power of the Spirit to expand, to restore the kingdom of God. What does this mean for us? We have the same Holy Spirit in every one of us. If you have confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we too have the same, exact same Spirit of God as in the first century, even in Guatemala. We have the same Spirit of God. But what is the problem? We must believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to restore. Maybe you and my God is so small. Maybe we don't expect so much of the Spirit. Oh, everyday, mundane, routine. I hope I just get by safely, my work being you know, well taken care of. The Holy Spirit is so much more than that. We must believe and trust in what Jesus said. He says, I will give you the power of the Spirit. The power will give you the, the power. The Spirit will give you the power to expand, to seek the kingdom of God. What are we afraid of? What are we oppressed by? Maybe it, we're oppressed by sin. We're, we're afraid of the uncertainty of life. I, I truly bless that you will be able to, to pray and rely upon the Holy Spirit every day who empowers us, who gives us the strength to push away the darkness of fear, uncertainty, but seeking that restoration that God can bring in our lives for the kingdom of God. Even uh, I myself find myself hearing you, know, you guys' prayers, asking me for prayers on the hallway, saying, Pastor, I'm sick this way. My family member is struggling. And, and I just stop right in there and, and pray for that person. And more often than not, I see them refreshed, renewed, boldened, emboldened in their spirit to go about living as a son or daughter of God. That is not my power. It is the Holy Spirit emboldening them, giving them the confidence and the peace to, to continue on the amazing things that you, are, you cannot humanly imagine to do. When the Holy Spirit works, He brings us the power to not dwindle, but expand to restore the kingdom of God. I pray that that power would manif be manifested every day in your life and my life. What happens when the Holy Spirit shows up and He works? He starts to restore the kingdom of God through us and in us. And secondly, what happens when the Holy Spirit shows up? He gives us the power to witness for the kingdom of God. Can we say this together as well? He gives us the power, gives us the power. to witness the kingdom of God. That's what verse 8 says, the latter part of verse 8, the famous verse that Jesus promised. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit. What kind of power? Not only to restore the kingdom of God, but how? By you and I becoming the witnesses of Jesus Christ here in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and also in Guatemala. This is the promise of God. Jesus is teaching his disciples and us what the, uh, more specifically, how Jesus, uh, the Spirit restores the kingdom of God. It is by us becoming Jesus' witnesses. He empowers us to say things that are not of our own, but which are powerful, and it always bears fruit when it is by the Holy Spirit. When our words are the words of the Spirit, it is powerful. There's nothing that can contain it. Because you and I have become the witnesses of Jesus Christ. We see in the, new, uh, in the uh, book of Acts on, from this point on how the disciples relied upon Jesus. And when they, uh, on the Holy Spirit, and then when they preached Jesus, even the heathens of the Roman Empire, they converted and trusted in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. When, you remember when, when Paul and, and Silas and Timothy went to that pagan city of Philippi, the first city in Europe. There was no church. There was no Christian whatsoever. And, and they preached. They witnessed Jesus Christ, the power of God. Holy Spirit changed a community. And the, a church was founded for the first time in Europe. We also remember when Paul was in Ephesus and the gospel was preached. They were witnesses of Jesus Christ. The entire community came upside down. And this community, which was worship, worshiping Diana, Di goddess Diana, they suddenly they had to burn all the, the, the false books, wizardry, and all the idols. 
and there was a, there was a church formed that changed the face of the entire Roman uh, world. When the Spirit of God works, and he uses his people as his witnesses. Those words do not come back void. It comes back with power. It comes back with the restored kingdom of God. You know, uh, this week, I uh, personally, I did more of a lecture ministry. I was able to teach pastors uh, in the area. Um, as you know, I went to Guatemala. And uh, thanks to Google, can you show us the map where, where it is? Maybe you could locate it. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's right below uh, Honduras, and uh, it's there in Central America. And uh, it took us three and a half hours from the airport of Guatemala City. Yeah, that's what the blue line is. The red dot, uh, hold on. <laughs> and the red dot is where we went. Yeah, that's the big lake, uh, Atitlan. Uh, I got to know that uh, it's a uh, Shtuhil language. Atitlan, At Atit means uh, fierce. Lan means man. So it's a big, grand lake. Uh, they say it's twice the size of Lake Tahoe. Can you see the show us the next slide? And over there, we were stationed at where the star is, uh, San Pedro, uh, St. Peter Village. And uh, we invited uh, Pastor Raul, the senior pastor of this church, invited those pastors that he was mentoring, he was caring for from like four or five neighboring villages. And they came from San Marcos, San, San uh, Juan, uh, and uh, San Diego, uh, and all these places. And so we had this uh, preaching seminar for a couple of days. Inside my heart, uh, there was uh, this burning burden on, in my heart. Because I know preaching is a very difficult task for these pastors, and for myself too. It is a holy burden, but indeed a very difficult task. I was teaching them. I was uh, communicating to them that our words mean nothing. You know, it's just gibberish, just, just sound waves. It accomplished nothing. But when we truly are preaching from this word, the truth of the word of God, it produces power. And I also uh, showed them, even the U.S., the churches who are preaching the word of God, explaining it well and applying it to the people's lives. Those churches are growing and lives are being changed and being saved. Whereas other churches, so-called churches that teach humanity, so moral doctrines and social issues, young people are leaving and there's death, there's dwindling in those myths. I try to teach that and I told them how to extract the principles of God from this word. But I was again burdened because I knew they were not theologically educated, they had not gone to seminary. You know, most of them learned preaching through imitation from their somebody, you know, preaching before them. And so I didn't want to burden them too much. I didn't want to discourage them from this hard work of preaching. So I was trying to sugarcoat it as much as possible until the next day I read we were doing the quiet time and uh, 1st Thessalonians chapter 2 13 really uh, touched my heart it reads and we also thank God constantly for this that when you received the word of God which you heard from us you accepted it not as the word of men but as what it really is the word of God which is at work in you believers Paul was telling the church in Thessalonica that you are able to withstand the persecution and difficulty, the bitterness of the Roman Empire because you received our word as the word of God. And this word of God gives you the power to sustain. I thank God for your uh, perseverance and your solid faith. When I read that, I took this as the word of God for me. Who am I to water down the word of God? Who am I to say, because this is so hard, you should you know, make it easier? I repented. I told them, frankly, pastors, this is hard work. You have to be on your knees to faithfully proclaim the word of God as it is. You have to study. You have to work at it. You have to sweat. And I knew. I, we have all, pastors in the U.S. have these commentaries, dictionaries, back, uh, background, all these books. But for them, they only have the Bible and maybe the internet. And so I, I knew how hard it, hard it was, but I, I did tell them the hard work it takes a lot, lot hard, hard time to, to study this word. And I thought, after lunch, they're going to go, oh, go, go away, not come back, right? I was fearful, like last year. You know, the half would be uh, missing after lunch. <laughs> Amazingly, they came back, you know. Maybe it was the gift that was promised to be. I don't know. They came back, and uh, they really enjoyed 
uh, the lecture. And they, and they told me, they had so many questions on preaching, and they said they needed this so much. Yes, they were preaching, but this just makes sense. These steps of finding the, word of, the meaning of the Word of God for ourselves, this makes sense. It's hard work, but thank you for saying that to us. Thank you for confirming our efforts of preachers of the Word of God. And, and there was a lot of uh, conviction and confidence and joy towards the end. And uh, one, one pastor who is from the neighboring village, he's not necessarily from the Baptist uh, circles, but he came, he's from a church, from a, a big church, mega church. There are like 500, 600 member churches there too. And uh, he says, you know, of all the seminars I heard, you know, the, the missionaries and you know, pastors come, this was the most beneficial to me. It really helped me. And he said, you know, could you come to us next year to my village to speak to the local leaders there? I was going, what had just happened? I'm not trying to promote myself. Don't get me wrong here. I was saying like, going like, wow, Holy Spirit really touched their lives. Holy Spirit really confirmed the preaching of the Word of God in all our pastors. I had this wow moment as the Spirit of God just uh, amazed us as, as our heart was beating together same heartbeat and uh, the Holy Spirit brought us to be one. Brothers and sisters, when we obey the Holy Spirit, when we trust in the Holy Spirit, He can use your weak lips, my weak lips, to witness the words of Jesus Christ. And when the words of Christ come out from our lives, from our mouths, when the testimony of what God has done in, in our lives comes out, it is not just your words, it's God's words, what God has done in our lives. And the Word of God promises us that, you know, uh, when the Holy Spirit comes, I will give you power. I will give you the dunamis, the dynam dynamic power to be able to um, see the restoration of the kingdom of God in those most dark places, in those places where there is no light, where there is discrimination, where there is injustice, where there is no love. The Word of God, the power of God will bring the kingdom of God restored and we'll see great joy in our lives. Brothers and sisters, why just the mission field? Right now, where you're sitting, where you're standing, is your mission field. Your home can be your mission field. Your workplace is your mission field. The same Holy Spirit who is working, who was working the first century, the same Spirit who worked in Guatemala, is still working in you and my life as we trust, entrust ourselves to Him, to His leading. As we go, as we speak the words of God, God will restore His kingdom wherever you might be serving. I pray that we will experience the joy of restoration. We will experience the joy of being life, life being changed every day through you and our lives as the Holy Spirit does His amazing wonders in all of our lives this week. Amen. Let's pray. So we go to our Lord. Let's lift up, lift up.